Good morning and welcome to our 20th broadcast this Sunday, August the 2nd, and it's been 20 weeks since we've had the opportunity to come and worship together. But I trust and pray as the Apostle John had mentioned, he says, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers in the grace of God. And our theme throughout this year is remember God is in control. And so no matter what you are facing, no matter how hard the times might get, God, your God, has everything under his mighty control. This first Sunday, I wanted to uh, say be prepared for communion. Deacon Hunter left me a note stating a couple times I had forgotten to do communion. So we will do communion. So right now, if you wanted to, you could go get some bread and crackers and some juice. Notice I didn't say wine, although they use wine in the early days. Uh, I don't want nobody walking around drunk on Sunday and saying that Pastor Lawson said, go drink some wine. So bread, crackers, juice, whatever you decide. Uh, while you are doing that, I wanted to remind you and I wanted to, again, thank our uh, ministers for uh, doing such a wonderful job with our Sunday school Zoom, and that's at 945. And so again, we uh, thank our ministers for leading us on the Sunday school, and I trust and pray that you will take advantage of those Sunday school lessons. Also, on Thursday, uh, we have the prayer conference. That's at 7 p.m., and we've been blessed to not only be able to take our petitions before God, but also to hear about the answers that have been coming in. So all of that information is on our uh, Facebook page, and you can get all of that information. You can either talk to some of the officers, and speaking of the officers, I think I forgot to mention that whenever we do appear, I do bring you greetings from uh, not only myself and First Lady Rosa Lawson, but also the, the reverends from the officers of the Joint Council, all the members, friends of the First Baptist Church, and we count it an honor to be able to come and share for just a few minutes. I did want to also thank the church for the birthday greetings and the birthday gift. Uh, yeah, another year went by, and uh, but thanks be to God. We are still in the land of the living. And so, again, to everyone uh, out there, uh, we're going to go right immediately and look into the Word of God. I'm going to try to keep this short today, uh, knowing that uh, people have a lot going on. And so, if you would turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, uh, that is the fourth of the Gospels, the Gospel of John, the first chapter, and we're going to look at only one verse in the Gospel of John. That is the 29th verse. The Gospel of John, the 29th verse. As always, I'm reading out of the New American Standard Version. The Gospel of John, the first chapter, the 29th verse. It reads as follows. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And thus ends the reading of God's holy and precious word. And I wanted to talk to you briefly today about God's solution. God's solution to your issues. God's solution to your problem. God's solution to the things that betwixt you. At this time, let us pray eternal and most high God. We thank you for your word. and We thank you for your Holy Spirit who lifted the blinders off of our eyes that we might behold the glory of Christ. And so I ask right now, Lord, that you would uh, uh, anoint these words and that you would point out to each of us your kindness, your rich mercy, and your amazing grace. And now, Lord, move the preacher out of the way, and I ask that you would speak to every need, that you would build up everything that's been torn down, and that you would speak hope to those who dwell in darkness. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers, and we count it as done. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the saints say amen and amen. God's solution to your issues. 
in this one sentence, John the Baptist summarizes the greatest work and the greatest miracle that Jesus the Christ ever performed. And that miracle is that he released you and I from an affliction that infects us all. And that affliction is called sin. And the death rate of that affliction is 100%. Now, put this in perspective. We talk about the COVID-19 and uh, the death rate. It's in the United States, 3.4%. In other words, 96% of the people that come down will not die, but that is a high rate when you compare it to the flu, which is about 1%. In some undeveloped countries, the death rate is up to 6%. That's with the coronavirus. That's with this virus that has shut the world down. But I'm talking about an infection today that is 100%. Because the Bible says that the soul that sins will surely die. The Apostle Paul in the fifth chapter of Romans said, As through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin... So death has spread to all because all have sinned. In other words, it's like you are not a sinner because you've committed sin. You commit sin because you are a sinner. In other words, you do it naturally. And you're good at it. And to be honest with you, we like it. Nobody had to teach you because it's in your nature. We're born with a sinful nature. If you don't believe me, look at the evidence. Look at this world. Look at the violence. Look at the hatred. Look at the fighting. Look at the racism. Look at the injustice, the brutality, the immorality, the selfishness, the pride, the arrogance, the addictions, the contention, the divisions, the fear, the anxiety, the depression, the anger, the unforgiveness, the gossip, the backbiting, the lying, the betrayal, the untrustworthiness, the unloving of people. They're unmerciful. Some of them are downright mean and nasty. Look around at the contention, the greed, the envy, the jealousy, the strife, the grudges, the revenge. Two-faced people, hypocritical and full of deceit. Do I have to go on? I think you get the message. That, that's a pretty good list. And if there's any of you out there that says, well, those things don't apply to you, let me add dishonesty. <laughs> the point is, beloved, we as humans have some serious issues. And so here John the Baptist says, behold, he sees Jesus coming and he calls those around him, says, behold, uh, that, that, that term he's really saying, take a look at something very unique and something very special. It's right in your midst. And if you're not careful, you're going to miss it. I'll give you an illustration this past week. I'm sitting in the living room of my house and my two granddaughters, Zahira and Zalea, they come running and say, the sky is purple. Come and look at what it was, the uh, sunset. I don't know when the last time you took time out to just look at the beauty of a sunset. And they were saying that the clouds were purple. And we talked about what happens during the sunset and why you get the different colors. And then they said, well, come and look. And I said, well, it might be over now because it, you get a quick reflection and the sun is gone. And they looked outside and they said, yeah, it's gone now. And so John the Baptist is saying, Take a look. Take a look while he is here. Because if you wait too long. And so he told his disciples around him, behold the lamb. Today we can't really appreciate the symbolism of what that means. A, a, a lamb, a young sheep, innocent and meek, used as a sacrifice the holy God. You see, the message here, beloved, is that sin is such a serious offense to God, it results in the death penalty. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. In the garden, Adam and Eve were given the privilege of eating from any tree or bush that they wanted. But God placed one limitation and said, the tree in the middle, you shall leave it alone. For on the day that you eat of its fruit, you will surely die. Here it is, just like a child. A, a child can be doing fine. And as soon as you tell them, don't do this, that's the very thing they want to do. You see the heart, the sin nature? So what did they do? They ate. Their eyes were open. They sold on fig leaves. They tried to hide from God. They finally had to face God. And God did something so merciful. It says an animal, he placed animal skins on them in place of the fig leaves. Oh, that's a whole other message in itself. But an animal lost its life. Why? Because the principle was being established without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. We see this throughout scripture. A ram was provided to Abraham in place of Isaac, whom God had said, will you put him before me or will you put me before him? And Abraham came down from the mountain saying, Jehovah Jireh, God supplies all of my needs. You see the principle established with the Passover lamb. This was instituted by Moses. Moses was commanded to tell Israel to kill this lamb and place the blood on the lintel and on the side of the doorpost so that the death angel, when he came through the land, killing the firstborn within all of Egypt, you would be spared. You see the blood covered. And the blood prevented us from receiving what we rightfully deserve. We see this also established through the Mosaic law as the daily lamb sacrifices were carried out by the Levitical priests as they covered the sins of the people and the sins of the nation. And oh, that great prophet Isaiah proclaimed that Christ would be a lamb that was silent before its shearers as he was led to the slaughter for you and me. Later on, the great apostle Peter Described Jesus as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And so here John the Baptist proclaims again, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Notice it didn't say who covers the sins of the world. No, 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 no. He says who takes away. In the Greek, it gives the impression on raising them up, placing them on your own self and carrying it away. In other words, completely removing the sin from our lives. Oh, what a God, what a God, what a God. Notice it says also sin, it says it in the singular. It's not talking about sins, it's talking about sin. In other words, your nature, the thing that causes you to do the things you do. Like the temptation, the way you do the things you do. It's singular because that sin nature, because of it, there is a penalty of death. But by Christ taking that sin nature and carrying it away, then death is completely removed from those who believe. Oh, the sin of the world. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ, beloved, is so efficacious that it has the capacity to forgive every sin committed since the beginning of time all the way to the end of time. And it is able to cleanse every sinner. So in other words, God has done what nobody else could do. God has brought you and I back into a right relationship. Three theologians call that atonement, that we are back oneness with God. It takes away that which was offensive to the holiness of God. It vacates the legal judgment against us and establishes a right relationship between God Almighty and his wayward children. Oh, what a God, what a God, what a God. And therefore, the Apostle Paul could say, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one
can boast. So, beloved, that one verse shows us that God's solution to your issues is through his son, Jesus the Christ. Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. He is the one who left the 99 in the fold, and he went looking for that one who was lost. And I'm not ashamed to say that I was the one, and I'm not ashamed to say that I ran from him and I resisted him, and I'm not ashamed to say that I fell down in my own sin, and I'm not ashamed to say that I struggle sometimes with sin, but I'm so glad that I'm not alone. Because he says, I'm going to send somebody to you, and he's the comforter. And the comforter is the one who protects my going out and my coming in. And so God's solution for me is that, no, I'm never alone. Uh, when I'm lonely, there's still somebody in the midnight hour that I can cry out to and say, Lord, thou will be done. Lord, lead me through it. And he said, I will hear every prayer. And I will answer and deliver them. And that's why I'm so glad to say today that I can join with the psalmist uh, when he said that weeping might endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. And so no matter what you are facing, beloved, God has made a way out of no way. I'm so glad today that even when I'm weak, he makes me strong. I'm so glad today. That even when I feel anxious or depressed, I'm not alone. I'm so glad today that when I struggle, I've got somebody that will struggle there with me. I'm so glad today that when I'm lonely, he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I'm so glad today that when I'm hungry, he will feed me with that heavenly manner. I'm so glad today that when it's hot outside and I'm thirsty on the inside, Side. He pours out that living water that will quench my thirst. I am so glad today that my soul has a resting place. And he said that he would never leave me nor forsake me. God's solution to your issues. And I pray to God today that you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. For the Bible says he's coming back one day for his church. And in the meanwhile, he has sent his Holy Spirit to lead and guide us all the way. That is my prayer for you. And I ask that you would join me in a prayer, and we're going to go right into our communion. Eternal God, I pray your peace and your mercy upon each and every one under the sound of my voice. And I pray that your angel will be a fence all around them, that you would protect their going out and their coming in from this day forth. And I ask now as we celebrate communion, celebrate your coming down and dying on our behalf, uh, that you uh, would grant them the peace that passeth all understanding. You would bless those who partake of these elements. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the saints of God say amen and amen. What a wonderful God that he would leave his glory and come down and dwell in a sin-cursed world. But he did it because he loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. And when Jesus met with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, the Bible says that they met in the upper room and he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. At this time, the body of Christ broken for you. And after they had eaten, he took wine and poured it into the cup and said, this is my blood, which is shed for the remission of your sins. And as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you call forth the Lord's second coming. Drink ye all of it. Beloved, 
as we have celebrated this communion, I pray and hope that you have a new appreciation for what God has done and that you are experiencing his presence, his power, his protection, his provisions, and the great hope of it all is that one bright morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home prepared for me in glory to be with him forever and ever. And joy and life will have no end. That is my prayer for you. Well, I got some things I got to get doing. And I got to get moving. I can't stay here. But I thank God for the presence of his spirit and for each and every one of you. Be blessed, my beloved. See you next Sunday, Lord willing. God bless.